Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us uh, for this edition of Community and Values. I'm Mary Clark. I'm Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor and delighted uh, to have you with us uh, today in honor of Women's History Month. Uh, we're having a program entitled The First of Women, The Urgency for Change and Institutional Leadership. And we'll look forward to exploring this topic with you. Uh, we have three guests, uh, two of them uh, internal guests, uh, joining us today for our Community and Values program. I'd love to start with uh, Dr. Deb Ortega. Dr. Deb Ortega, as many of us know, is a professor in the Just got muted. Uh, Deb is uh, a professor in the Graduate School of Social Work. Uh, Deb is also the founding director of the Latinx Center for Community Engagement and Scholarship. This is our fabulous center for interdisciplinary faculty, interdisciplinary scholarship that is dedicated to creating and advancing knowledge that gives voice to history, politics, culture, and legacies of the Latinx communities. A licensed clinical social worker, uh, Dr. Ortega joined DU's Graduate School of Social Work in 2005, uh, becoming DU's first Latina full professor. Deb's research uh, is funded by the US Department of Health and Human Services and focuses on children and families. So we're very pleased to have Dr. Ortega with us and lovely uh, to see you on screen this morning. I now would like to introduce Dr. Maria Salazar. Dr. Maria Salazar is a professor of teaching and learning sciences in our own Morgridge College of Education. Uh, Dr. Salazar is instrumental in the teacher education program. Uh, her teaching and research focus on equitable and effective teaching, culturally responsive teaching, college access and success for Latinx students. Uh, she has spoken widely nationally and internationally at research conferences and has provided numerous keynotes, uh, one of which I saw in your bio uh, was quite uh, compellingly entitled The Hope despair and tenacity of a rose uh, that grew in concrete. And I am pleased to invite our third uh, panelist, Representative Iman uh, Jida. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Representative Jida became Colorado's first ever Muslim lawmaker when she was elected to represent uh, House District 41, which encompasses parts of Aurora in the Colorado General Assembly and was elected uh, in November, 2020. Uh, the daughter of Palestinian immigrants to Aurora, Colorado, Representative Jida taught about Islam at the University of Colorado at Denver, served as a liaison for the Interfaith Alliance of Colorado, serves as a board member of the Women's Lobby of Colorado, and has been a longstanding advocate for first-gen Americans and for people of color, including Arab Americans here in Colorado. I'm so delighted uh, to welcome our three panelists uh, for this important discussion. So thank you uh, for joining us. My first question invites you to reflect on this year being the 100th anniversary of uh, women's suffrage uh, in the United States. Um, and also the election, of course, of our first woman uh, vice president, uh, Kamala Harris. I would love to hear your reflections on uh, progress made, uh, progress still to be made. Uh, how do we understand uh, Vice President Harris's election uh, in the context of this 100th anniversary uh, of women's suffrage uh, here in the US? and not to be shy. <laughs> Whoever would like to jump in first, I would welcome. I'll, I'll jump in um, and uh, just quickly, it, um, it's Representative Iman Judah. And um, a nice note to DU is I used to teach at DU, not CU. So um, although my alma mater is CU. Um, you know, I think the historic election of Vice President Harris is you know, incredibly long overdue. And, um, you know, something that will be a good step and is a good step forward for women everywhere, especially in the United States. Um, after I was elected, 
um, I had a lot of international um, uh, interviews from news outlets, not only across the Middle East and Muslim world, but you know, ranging from Australia to South America. And um, a, a question that came up was in fact this question about women in politics in the United States. And it was curious to me that, you know, the outside world was looking in on the United States as almost behind the curve on this. And the reason for that is because uh, other places in the world are leaps and bounds when it, ahead of us when it comes to women participating in civic engagement and, and policy. Um, the Muslim world alone, which is often viewed as primitive and behind and non-democratic, has democratically elected nine women heads of state. Yet the United States continues to claim to be the most progressive democratic country in the world. So I caution us when we talk about how progressive we are on the front of gender equality and, and, and equity and really start to look to those that have had a successful track record in uplifting women, um, not only culturally, but walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Uh, I think unfortunately the United States has had a very long and sad track record around colonization and and, and systemic racism that isn't just embedded in um, our BIPOC communities, but also has translated and manifested itself into what it means to be a woman in this country, whether it is fighting for equal pay, for equal work, or protecting her own reproductive rights and decisions about her body. Very helpful, thank you. Thank you, and a very helpful perspective in terms of uh, Muslim uh, nations uh, leading uh, in terms of electing women uh, by contrast to the United States. Um, we'd love to hear Deb or Maria's uh, thoughts in reflection on this question. What a great opening and uh, to, this, to the answer to this question. I think especially um, how different contexts where women um, are respected or valued, it, it varies, right, by each context. And, and thinking about what did it mean in the Obama era when Obama was elected and all of a sudden we had a post, I mean, I didn't get the notice, maybe everyone else got the notice, it was a post-racial era. Still waiting for that notice and for that to happen. But also thinking about, about the same situa situation with Vice President Harris. And and that idea of, oh, now we've arrived. And for me, these are the myths that actually keep equity from happening. It's that perspective or perception that we've arrived when we know all we have to do is look at STEM. Um, Provost Clark and I have been on, <clears throat> on a grant around women and, and people of color in STEM and how they're very much excluded from that experience. And I was, it's so funny. It, well, amazing that you brought up the issue around other countries that have women in these um, high level political positions, because I was wondering just the other day, does that mean their STEM education looks different for women? And, and is that part of the measure about where we are as a society in, in our ideas around equity and the value of, of of women in these traditionally held spaces of men. So for me, a breakthrough is not a, so a societal change. Sometimes a breakthrough is, is followed by backlash. And that's what I'm, I'm curious to see um, as we move forward is, is how that kind of plays out. Very helpful, very helpful. And that pattern of breakthrough and backlash is uh, quite a, a current and recent uh, experience here in the US. Dr. Salazar, would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think similarly to um, both our speakers, I would agree around this issue of 
Um, it obscures the progress really, right? When we uphold one person as the model like we did with Barack Obama or like we do with Kamala Harris, it obscures the progress that most women are making, right? In terms of looking at any major indicator, economic, political health, we see that women of color and immigrant women are struggling, right? And we see that as a historical pattern that has not changed. And so how important it is not to obscure our reality as we make progress, right? Uh, but I also struggle with putting all women in the same box, like I struggle with putting Latinos in the same box, right? Um, there are huge disparities, huge varieties, huge um, disparities in access, right, to um, many, many indicators of, of life that really help us to be successful. And I'll give you an example. Kamala Harris um, had a different starting line than other women do, right? Um, she definitely had challenges without question, but that was a different starting line than, uh, for example, I had with a parent, parents who had a third grade and a sixth grade education and were Mexican immigrants, right? And so I think we also have to unpack those identities around what does womanhood mean and what does it mean to have privilege even within that, whether that's the color of your skin or your socioeconomic status or your sexual orientation. So that idea of intersectionality and how we need to unpack that and not put one woman um, as the standard for all women because we don't all have the same starting line and we don't all have the same identities or experience. And I guess to your uh, comment, what progress have we made in that regard? When you think of womanhood, womanhood has many uh, elements, many attributes, uh, many understandings uh, today. The women's rights movement, of which I'm a historian, has not always understood that. And I would love to hear your reflections on to what extent are those intersecting identities uh, now uh, healthfully embraced? Uh, within uh, the women's rights movement or women's rights movements, which is probably uh, better um, phrased. So we'd love to hear your reflections on the extent to which uh, intersecting identities are now uh, respected and embraced for women. Since I went last, I'll start first on this one because yeah. I could connect my comments as well. I don't think we have a women's rights movement. I think we have a white women's rights movement. And that's what it has been historically, right? When you talk about the suffragist movement, it was the white women suffragist movement. And so historically white women have excluded women of color to move themselves forward. We even see that with the Me Too movement, right? Um, we've seen the Black Lives Matter space be a space where black women can articulate their rights as well. Right? But that hasn't happened often in the women's rights movement, where all women can articulate um, what we have in common, but also our distinctions. And so I, I would challenge our, and I typically do when I hear um, the term women's rights, I say, wait a minute, whose rights are we talking about here? Because we're typically talking about white women. Just like when we talk about STEM and diversifying STEM and we talk about including women, my question is always, wait, are we talking about white women? Because that um, is a limit to the diversification of STEM, right? So I would challenge the notion that we have a women's rights movement. I think that women of color have had to find their space in other areas um, to advance uh, what they need and to advance what they need in a way that's different. And that there's nothing wrong with that, with articulating that we don't all have the same experience and we don't all face the same obstacles as well. And I'm quite mindful of that in the current pandemic, just the very differentiated experiences uh, that uh, folks who are defined as women uh, have had uh, in this time. Uh, Dr. Ortega, I would love to hear from you uh, next in your reflections on the extent to which intersecting identities are recognized, respected, and embraced at this time. Well, and I would add to Dr. Salazar's comments, right? White women and white Christian women as, as also a, a, a place of who has rights where. And I would say we're not, we're not very good at intersectionality at any level, frankly. Um, and what probably concerns me most is, is history, right? History teaches us a lot. And what we know historically is that affirmative action has benefited white women. But also what we know is as women, as white women have succeeded, that some of the um, lawsuits and, and objections to affirmative action, uh, say in college admissions, 
has also come from white women students who've been have, who have not been accepted to colleges. So for me, there's this really interesting space about once I get there, then then either race or religious perspective or cisgender, you know, who gets to then follow through the door? Well, you can't follow through the door. And um, and frankly, I probably would also add my experience is is some in some ways um, when white women talk about their experience of exclusion, they feel like it's the same as other women of intersectional identities. And um, I, I've been saying this a lot in these spaces. I've actually also experienced that with white cisgendered lesbian women um, who come from more wealth than I'm, I'm used to being around and see a lot of the um, inability to kind of stretch to understand beyond their own experience and, um, and still engaging in those ways which um, silences or um, lacks awareness of the, the, the fight, the struggle, right, of women who have intersectional identities. Very much so, uh, very much so. So thank you for that. Representative, I'd love to hear your thoughts and potentially uh, in reflection on your own recent election campaign and election. Yeah, and you know, I wanna also echo what my colleagues have said here today. People are not a monolith. Women are definitely not a monolith and our advocacy is not a monolith. And I think as we watch and witness a sea change happening in our community around what it is to advocate, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's immigration, whether it's reproductive rights, you know, whatever torch you choose to carry, um, that sea change also needs to recognize that that translates differently for different communities. Um, I am a voting member of the Black Caucus, and I am the first person who does not identify as Black to be a member of the Black Caucus as a voting member. But I think the reason this was important was because I was argu arguably one of the most unique incoming legislative members who didn't fit into a caucus based on race, ethnicity, or religion um, with any other caucus. And so the Black Caucus recognized this uniqueness. And I bring this up because in that uniqueness, there was also a kinship in oppression. Because I hold these identity markers, a Palestinian American uh, uh, Muslim woman of color, I inherently have identity markers and lived experiences that unfortunately, um, are also shared with our black and brown communities. And while I definitely want to recognize that each of those lived experiences for each group is in fact their respective and individual experiences, um, the fact remains that when you have that unfortunate kinship in oppression, um, there tends to be a different lens to your advocacy. Um, so, you know, when we, when we think about um, um, sexual harassment, right? There is in fact that kinship in that lived experience, even though that sexual harassment may not have been identical to someone else's experience, right? And, um, you know, this is that lens that I think um, I bring in my representation is that not only is important that people see themselves in their representation, but also can identify that we have a shared lived experience and that we also have an obligation as members of our community to recognize that um, those lived experiences are in fact what will drive this, this sorry, the sea change into a community, a nation, a state, uh, which we truly envision for ourselves and our future. I'll end by saying, you know, there's that great meme out there on Facebook that we've seen a lot in the BLM movement and in, in, in the Me Too movement. 
we the people did not include BIPOC communities, that all men are created equal did not include BIPOC communities or women. And so how do we start to reimagine and reframe that conversation in a way that does in fact honor, represent, and is a true breath and reflection of our community today? And your comments make me think about the educational system, uh, K-12 as well as higher ed, uh, but thinking about uh, K-12 in particular, what changes uh, are needed uh, so that young people, girls in particular, of intersecting identities uh, can see a life of uh, potential, a life of possibility for themselves. Would love to hear your reflections on that. You know, I felt lucky to have people in my life growing up that taught me it was my right and not a luxury to have a voice and to participate in any arena that I felt necessary. And I think thinking back at my, you know, being a first generation American and navigating these spaces for my parents and with my parents, I also recognized that there was a huge void in that advocacy and that voice. I distinctly remember in middle school and in high school, typing letters to staff and teachers that, hey, if you have a Muslim student, please be aware that we're going to start fasting for the next 30 days. They may be a little lethargic. They may be a little more tired. Please make space and grace for that. Our holidays were never on school calendars. Ramadan was never recognized. And so someone had to do it. And I just thought there was no one else to do it. And I carried that voice through my career and its infancy and to today. And I, I, I definitely want to recognize that I stand on the shoulders of those before me. And I think about RBG saying, you know, women should be in places where all decisions are being made. And I have been able to utilize my identity, not only as a Muslim, but as a Palestinian American practicing uh, 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 Muslim to put myself in these rooms where decisions are being made, but to understand I'm not there to check a box for white communities. I'm not there to be a warm body. I'm there to in fact influence and contribute to the conversation so that our communities have representation, so that women feel they have a voice in spaces that they don't have access to otherwise. So along those lines, Drs. Ortega and Salazar, uh, how do we instill that sense of voice uh, in young people? Uh, but I'm thinking of girls and young women in particular. Uh, what about the classroom uh, might impact on that? sense of discovery of voice uh, or other opportunities within the educational setting. Dr. Ortega, do you want to go next or do you want me to go? Well, your bailiwick is education, so how about you go? Yeah, so I'm so excited about this question. So absolutely, this is my area of research and expertise. Um, but I first I want to say I'm in awe of Representative Iman's voice and experience and how that has led her to where she is today. I unfortunately did not have that experience, Representative Iman. And um, in my research, I write about it. And in my book, I write about how my first grade teacher stole my humanity. Um, and the way that my first grade teacher stole my humanity was she made me leave my treasures at the classroom door, right? I had this this mochila, this backpack with all my treasures. And it was my family and my culture and my language. And she didn't let me bring it in. And my teachers throughout K-12 in the Denver public schools, by the way, were complicit in this thievery, right? And they stole my humanity. Part of what stole my humanity is that I never saw myself reflected in the curriculum. I never saw women at all, but I never saw women who look like me or people who look like me. And so that led me to believe that people who look like me never accomplished anything, right? And so in the third grade, I became a connoisseur of whiteness and I decided to get into the top reading group so that the color of my skin would change and I would become white. 
And I was terribly disappointed when this didn't happen. And so I was the first in my family and the only to go to college after seven siblings. My parents have a third and a sixth grade education. They're Mexican immigrants. And I didn't find my voice until the doctorate, until I found Paulo Freire and my advisor, Maria Franquis. I didn't find my voice until then, right? In fact, in my home, my voice was discouraged and I would face physical violence for um, in any way, shape or form questioning my father. So my voice was, it was very much a risk to use your voice and I didn't find it until that doctorate. So what do we need to do so that children, women, young girls, especially young girls of color don't have this experience. That is my life's work at the University of Denver. Um, and right now, one of the research projects I'm working on is the Freedom School, where I'm working with the Righteous Rage Institute and educators to build the Freedom School. And this is a school that is um, held in the community twice a month. But we're also now embedding it into Denver, Mar um, Dr. Martin Luther King Early College. So starting next year, we'll be embedding it from sixth through 12th grade in the school. And our whole goal here is to help children find their voice, to love who they are, to be proud of who they are, to be prepared academically and to know their history. And I teach my children that we can't help but be great because we have greatness in our blood. Our ancestors are the Incas, the Mayans, and the Aztecs. And that's what we want children to understand, that they have greatness in their blood, that their heritage sets them up for success and sets them up for greatness, and that they should love the color of their skin and their hair and all of their treasures, while also preparing for what they will face in higher education, right? And preparing for that cultural capital they will need to be successful. So we can absolutely do this. Unfortunately, the system does not allow us to do this. Higher ed and K-12 systematizes white ways of knowing and really forces us into these spaces so that we can be successful. We have to be able to take on these ways of knowing, but sometimes we lose ourselves in the process. So helping young women, um, especially women of color to not lose themselves in this process as they're navigating the systems is highly important. And this work begins in early childhood. We can't wait until high school or college. We have to prepare our young women, especially young women of color in early childhood for this process. Thank you, Dr. Salazar. Thank you for those reflections. And Dr. Ortega, I'd love to know how your work with children and families um, reflects on this question of voice, finding voice, finding agency. You know, it's, it's, so Dr. Salazar and I have actually published several works together and um, I just, also want to recognize the way that what she just described is the way that she's really developed this concept of humanizing pedagogy, um, which has been, I think is an amazing gift to, to our thinking around education. Um, I do want to start off with telling you that I went to 21 years of Catholic school, not because my family had a lot of money. By age 10, my dad had died and my mom was raising me and she was a manicurist. But I did go to Catholic nursery school starting at like age zero because um, my family was really involved with the nuns who ran the nursery school and they were from Mexico. So my early educational experience was with Mexican nuns. And I've often reflected on how that influenced my whole educational experience very early on because I look like the people who taught me and I wasn't separate. Well, maybe I was even had more attention because my family was so involved with, with, with the nuns and the, and the maintenance of the preschool and all, and all this. Um, and I'm saying that to sort of put that, and then the rest was sort of partly by an accident of geography and religion, right? For the, the, the quality of the schools that I went to. What I actually think is, is that we need a complete overhaul of our education system because we have ceased to teach our children how to think critically. And we continue to not only teach inside a box, but, but also ignore what the research says about what's happening in our schools. And how that works for, for children and families is hearing from the educational system that the reason why they're not being successful is because of them, right? Because 
um, their families don't care about, or our families and our communities don't care about education, which is a myth. Um, that um, it's, you know, black and brown boys and, and actually girls are aggressive or um, uh, misbehaving in ways that are completely subjective. Uh, in, as opposed to how they evaluate white students, which is really objective. So what happens is families internalize this and because they have very high standards for their children, they, um, they don't really understand what's happening and keep trying to fix something in a way that they actually don't know how to fix um, because they haven't had access, access to schools as Maria said. My, um, my mom didn't finish high school and I think now that's a privilege because my mom saw the inside of the high school. Right now, I, uh, I've had students in our graduate program whose parents don't read or write in any language, um, have never been inside of a school. And, and thinking about how they've been grown up in the United States and then have been excluded over and over again um, and targeted. And the funny, the funny thing is, so I'm a godmother of several, of several children, and um, two of them are boys, and one of them is in school, right, in like, I don't know, whatever school age you are when you're about nine or 10. And, I, and all his parents have master's degrees, and he is, he is um, Latino and Filipino, he's dark, he, and he was being targeted in school with all the things that are classic in research, right? That he was being too loud, he was disruptive. And we saw on a video that his mom, he was like doing a poem in the, in the class and his mom was videotaping. And you could see that all the children were acting the same, including him, but he was being targeted by the teacher. So education of your parents doesn't actually protect you either. So this is the part where I think this overhaul of our education system, because frankly, excluding whoever Maria Salazar teaches, that reproduction of those values is happening over and over ag again. And, and the education system is the biggest pusher of um, bias actually in stereotyping, right? Followed by really the legal profession that punishes you when you step outside the value system differentially based on race and religion and, and all those things. So from the perspective of the families, they struggle a lot to try to figure out how to negotiate what they think is their faults. And, um, and it's a relief often when we can explain to them what is the structural pieces that are keeping them from succeeding and helping them negotiate that. Um, but until that system changes, we know, because we can continue to just look at the same problem over and over again, that gets exacerbated from things like um, less and less uh, financial support from education from the federal government, right? And, and so then not only is it what's happening, like once you do, you, you might even be able to access college, it's so far out of your reach financially um, that we're now having a kind of college education of a kind of class system that is also racialized. Very much so. So when you speak of the reproduction of power, uh, we see it uh, embedded uh, in the educational uh, system uh, quite starkly. Uh, why do we find ourselves in the US, this is a bit of a pivot, why do we find ourselves in the US having just elected uh, the first woman uh, vice president, uh, first uh, woman of color uh, as vice president, as distinct with some of the uh, leading nations of the world. And Representative, I'm mindful of where you started us uh, when you think of Pakistan, uh, likewise when you think of India, uh, any number, uh, Israel, uh, any number of countries that have been led by women uh, long before the United States uh, is. And uh, why, why is that? Uh, what cultural values, what uh, dynamics uh, would you highlight uh, in assessing why the US is so far behind? You know, when I think about the Muslim world in particular, um, I think it's worth mentioning that the West has done a very good job about at painting a very broad brushstroke and um, 
you know, convincing Americans that women are second class citizens in the Muslim world and the Arab world, and that we in fact do not have a voice. Um, there is a chapter in the Quran called Al Nisa or the woman, and there's not a chapter called the man. And throughout the entire Quran, it gives women's women rights not granted to women in the West until the 1920s. And among these rights is her right to run for office and to have a divorce, to own her own business, to participate in civic engagement. And, you know, I, I think it's reflected um, in, in society when these things happen um, and they happen quite frequently. But the squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? And those, uh, you know, more right-wing countries that are really very few and far in between have, uh, for a lack of a better term, trumped the um, religion and have managed to uh, paint the picture for um, billions of people around the world that find uh, Islam as a way of life. And I mention this because, um, you know, I think it's important that we remember when you have it literally built into the foundations of society, of community, then you start to have a different lens on the role of different people in government. In the United States, that was never a founding principle. And that literally set the tone for the next hundreds of years and the role women would play in society from the highest levels of government to right here in our homes. And unfortunately, it has taken that long for us to get as far as we have. I literally remember, and Dr. Salazar, I wanna recognize that I share this unfortunate kinship with you, right? that I did not see people who looked like me in my teachers, in my representation, in community. Um, and I was often the person being told, try not to be too Palestinian. I was often the person being told what you're saying um, does not align with curriculum. And ironically, we are on the floor right now debating a media literacy bill that can really dictate the future of education and challenge our students and their ability to really filter uh, uh, information that they're getting on, on a, a, a truthful basis. So, um, you know, I think doctors Ortega and Salazar and I have all had these really unfortunate experiences growing up about our identities. But also in that growing up and in that childhood and adolescence, I distinctly remember being told a woman could never be president. Can you imagine if she's on her period and she has the nuclear codes? That was literally told to me. And I believed it because I didn't know any better because no one told me that it was possible, that it is our right and it's not a luxury. And so this is the shift in conversation in a true, the roots of our culture that has to change on a fundamental level. We cannot continue to just jump on the bandwagon and say me too, jump on the bandwagon and say women have the right to do this, this and this. This is the time where we have to put that advocacy into action. Right. When people talk about, yay, Biden got elected. Yay, we elected a, a woman vice president. We, we can't get complicit now. This is when the real work starts and we have to guide this administration. We have to guide local leaders, organizations and electeds to make sure that their policies, that their curriculums, that their agendas are a true reflection of the work of these bandwagons that we have fought so hard to steer and to get us to the point, like I said earlier, that is a true reflection of where we want our girls and women to end up in the future. We'd love to hear others' thoughts uh, on this. So I think the reason why we haven't 
move forward is because it economically um, benefits men who hold most of the wealth and continuously have. Most of the reasons why things happen the way they do in our country is around wealth and protecting wealth. Um, even discussing this thing about what, you know, why does the US highlight the most conservative um, Islamic nations? I'm reminded that the CIA's, the first country the CIA ever destabilized was Iran to protect British oil. It was uh, Kermit Roosevelt actually who was involved in that. And that was, you know, of a democratically elected leader, right, at the time. So this thing about who we choose to highlight and how we talk about each other is really about, the answer for me always comes down to who benefits, who's benefiting from this. And who benefits is really the people at the top who hold most of the wealth and even the court systems, right, in divorce proceedings. And if you look at the way that women's work is, is demeaned, even in those situations, even as we say it's getting more and more equal, um, women are still being unfairly um, judged or, or, I mean, we can look at salaries. We can look at, um, you know, our own university had to look at its salaries, right? As it looked at, at, at the, the law school women and the gender inequity in payment um, under a different provost. And so, um, you know, those kinds of things is about where does the wealth where's the most wealth protected? And it's, it's not with women, right? It's with men. And so this, strat, this, this stratification is really based on economics, which is to me not a surprise in a capitalist nation, right? Where profit actually, not to use the word Trump, but Trump's humanity. Dr. Salazar, I'd love to turn to you and you can uh, bring us home before we turn to questions from the audience. Sure, thank you so much. I think I also just want to focus on this idea of systems, right? And how um, the isms really are woven into the fabric of this nation and the systems and the machinery that has been created, right? There's lots of examples of this throughout K-12 education. But I want to give you an example in higher education, right, about how systems really maintain these inequalities. Um, and that is appointment promotion and tenure, right? and how that privileges certain ways of knowing and how a, you can look at patterns there. I'm on our APT committee around how white men excel, right, and men excel. And so, again, there is this notion of, well, it's just part of the fabric of the institution but yet it maintains inequality and it creates this ivory tower, right? Um, that maintains its ivoriness for a purpose as Dr. Ortega was talking about, which is to maintain power and privilege and really keeps us from our communities in many ways, right? Keeps us from making an impact on our communities, which then reinforces power and privilege and oppression. So there's lots of examples of those systems, but I also remind people that we are the systems, right? We are the systems, we've created these systems, we've upheld them and we can tear them down. So I think that would be a great segue into questions as well. It's a fabulous segue and it's a fabulous segue to the moderator uh, of our questions. That'll be Dil Khan, uh, who is a graduate student here at DU, who was my interlocutor uh, the last time I was on the CNV screen. So Dil does a lovely job. Uh, of facilitating questions. And I would uh, enjoy having this opportunity to thank our panelists. Uh, thank you to Dr. Salazar. Thank you to Dr. Ortega. Thank you to Representative Gita for joining us. I know you're uh, in session right now. So I'm uh, really thrilled that you've been able to join us uh, this morning. And so over to you, Dill. Uh, we would love for you to um, take us through our audience members' questions. Great, thank you, Provost Mary. Um, and before I just start with the questions, I want to say to everyone watching and to our panelists, a happy belated International Women's Day. Um, so starting with a question from the audience, um, we had a, an attendee ask uh, Aaron. They asked, uh, they were wondering if you have any recommendations for articles or books around today's topic.
Okay, I would recommend you go to the iRISE website and I'll type it in here, University of Denver iRISE. We have a lot of really fantastic resources there um, in terms of readings as well. And some of our scholarship is there too. It's such a giant question. I, you know, I have like a zillion different books sort of flying through my head. And I'm like, well, there's fiction and, um, and there's, you know, nonfiction and there's all these places and, and spaces and the intersectional piece is, is also um, hard. I think the most important thing I would say is read, right? Like read and, and as part of the DU community, some people don't realize we also have access to things like Canopy, which has documentaries, right? It's a film space where you have documentaries. We have audiobooks at the library. I wanna give a giant shout out to the library because they've done a lot around keeping these things, uh, uh, keeping us connected to, to multiple ways of learning. Um, and, um, and so that's what I would suggest, you know, find something you like and, or something you've heard from one of us, maybe look at the, some of the things that we've written. Um, um, yeah, that's what I would say. I would just add, um, you know, I would challenge yourself and maybe branch out and, and read things that you maybe normally wouldn't read, even if you disagree. Um, I think having a strong understanding of the other side can help you often um, strengthen your own advocacy. Uh, other things that I love telling young people is if you have the means and ability to travel safely, um, travel to places that are maybe underrepresented or even in our own state um, or, or around the world that aren't as popular as Italy or Costa Rica. I have taken many, many DU students and, and Americans from the ages of 14 all the way to 85 to the Middle East. And it was the unpopular thing for them to do, but they did it. And I think it really uh, shaped their worldview by just simply providing a platform that is otherwise unavailable to them. So, um, you know, in addition to reading and research, which is amazing, I would really challenge folks to get out of their comfort zone, even if it means having a conversation with with the other side, whatever the other side is in your world, and 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 reach out, break bread with these folks, and 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 see where where those conversations take you. Absolutely. Um, someone from our audience asks. Um, we created these systems, therefore we can deconstruct these systems. What do you think is a good first step or next step to collectively work towards deconstructing systems in our organizations? Can you, can you maybe repeat it one more time? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, what do you think is a good first step or next step to collectively, collectively work towards deconstructing systems in our organizations, assuming that we can deconstruct these systems that we create in the first place? I think first you have to be engaged in the systems in some ways, right? Like, and there's a lot of talk about allyship and um, that's probably not my most favorite topic because in some ways I see allyship, um, to me allyship often the ally is actually getting a lot out of being an ally and, um, and that gets really complicated. I think what we really need to do as individuals is confront the everyday way we see things when it just doesn't, when it, when it, when it also costs us. That's when I think someone really is showing up for me is when they feel like they have something actually to lose and yet they still speak up because it's really easy to speak up when all your friends are gonna think you're the bomb diggity, right? Or, or, or it makes you feel quote unquote woke or whatever that is. It's much harder to start to engage people um, in conversations that are hard to have, um, but important to have respectfully for certain. Um, but letting things slide, and we so often do as a method of being polite, really re a, reinforces the problematic thinking around these structures. And, um, and B, when someone is speaking up and you're not supporting them, they think that the quietness is often in support of, of whatever they're trying to stand up for. And many of us who 
have decided that our humanity is linked to actually truth speaking. Um, just keep continue to move forward, even if you're not going to support us. But I'll tell you something, it's a really exhausting. So it's, it's so life giving when one person even stands with you in a moment, um, when you're doing the hard work of it. Um, and that's the only way we're really going to change. And then the second thing is, every young person in your life, you have to engage them in how to think outside the box. So I remember the, this is an, this is kind of a funny example, but Maria Salazar and I have been working together since 2005. And I remember the first time she told me that she had this conversation with her daughter, who's now at DU as a, as a student. And Maria said, um, Sophia, brown is the prettiest color of the rainbow. And that's like one small example of a young person. I say this to all the young people I know. Brown is the prettiest color of the rainbow. And they say, there's no brown in the rainbow. I said, you're not looking hard enough, right? Like it's at all levels where we start to engage our, everyone in, in our surroundings about how to, how to do the work and to think, right, for ourselves or for our communities. I would add to Dr. Ortega that and I'm going to just tell a quick story. I was teaching a class at DU and um, it was about, uh, it was called uh, Life Under Occupation from a Palestinian Perspective. And uh, that particular night I was teaching my Gaza unit and I showed some footage from Arabic TV that was incredibly graphic. And, um, you know, oftentimes uh, international TV is not censored. And I was accused by some students that it was doctored and that um, I was using it to push an agenda. And so in that moment, I was viewed as the emotional brown Palestinian girl teaching about Palestine. I wasn't viewed as an expert in the, in the topic who had credibility and legitimacy. There were 78 people in that class. And it only was until a white man stood up in the front of class and said, I'm a doctor with Doctors Without Borders. And I was in Gaza during the Gaza incursion and I can vouch for what she's saying. In that moment, he used his privilege to uplift a woman of color who was being attacked. And while it might have been a microaggression, maybe even a macroaggression, right? Um, he was able to say, I have this platform to uplift someone by way of my privilege and give her credibility and legitimacy. Now, we can unpack that situation in a lot of different ways. It's sad that it took that to give me credibility and legitimacy. But I always mention him and, and him and I have this conversation to this day that he recognized that window for him to stand up for someone by using his privilege. And what's even harder to do is to use your privilege. And I don't just mean white privilege. I find that I have privilege because I speak Arabic, that I know cultural nuances between the Muslim and Arab community and being in America. I find those as a privilege. Whatever you identify as your privilege, if you find yourself in spaces where someone you know is being attacked and you don't agree, using your privilege to defend and stand up for that person when they are not there to do it for themselves. That to me is a true sign of solidarity and trust and the ability to stand up for what you believe in to start to shift this conversation and change those systemic racism, uh, change systemic racism at the core and the, the fundamental um, foundation of what plagues our society. Dr. Salazar, I wanna give you the space to answer that question. If not, I can move on to the next one. Sure, I know I was just conscious of our time as well. Um, but I, I do wanna say that I think there's personal um, actions that you can take, right? And then there's systemic actions that challenge the system. 
on a personal note, I think we've got to take risks, right? And I've done that many times at the University of Denver. Sometimes there are consequences to those risks as well, right? So you've also got to take the consequences that come with taking those risks. But um, if you don't take personal responsibility, then who will? I was recently on a committee at the University of Denver that's looking at um, undergraduate education and the general education. And I challenged a faculty member who said, it's not this committee's job to transform the university. And I challenged her and said, then whose is it, right? Then whose responsibility is it if not yours? Does that mean that it falls to me as a faculty of color? Does that mean that it falls to our undergraduate students of color? If not your responsibility, then whose? So I think taking that personal responsibility is so important and taking those risks, right? And in that way, we can challenge those systems when people aren't aware of it. Um, we can make them aware whether they want to be or not. Absolutely. Um, I think we only have time for one more question. We have several, but it looks like we only have time for one more. Um, as current and former faculty members, do you happen to have tangible suggestions for DU that we can implement to be more inclusive to women and specifically women um, who are black, indigenous, indigenous, Latinx and Asian people of color. I can repeat that question if you would like. I'll answer very quickly. I think when you are a private school that has optics in community as being a private school of privilege, you need to have staff, faculty, and admissions that reflect your values. And if their values are truly to incorporate and to uplift these communities, then they need, I will be very blunt, and I know this may be hard to hear for some folks, to uh, stop following the money and actually put into practice um, the, the, the values that they share with community and isn't reflective of who's the highest donor or who drives curriculum based on those donors. Go ahead, Maria. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, would, I would echo that around action, right? The actions speak louder than words. We often get um, communications from the university and I often wonder, well, what are the actions behind it, right? Um, I think one of the clearest areas is um, the recruitment and retention of faculty of color. And that is something that really needs to be systematized and supported. Every college does it in a different way. And I know that um, the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion is really working toward that um, to create more equitable structures, but there's also the retention piece, right? Once you get us in the door, how do you keep faculty and students, I would say, and staff? So, that applies to students, faculty, and staff. And then really re-examining appointment promotion and tenure, I think from the perspective of, is the University of Denver moving toward a research one institution? And what does that mean for appointment promotion and tenure? I think that's another place that is very concrete. So what, I know one of the things we know actually across across the United States and in higher education is that women of color, people of color are um, assigned more service work. So like we do more mentoring, we do every time someone says the word race or diversity or inclusion, we're on the committee. Um, and when there's so few of us, that means we're on a lot of those committees. And so we know this happens um, across the nation. And service is the thing that it doesn't matter, frankly, in 99% of departments, service is not going to get you tenure. In fact, it will be the thing that might prohibit you from getting tenure because you're, draw, you're drawn in that way. And we already feel responsible to our communities. Um, so I'm saying that to, to think about how we actually value the work uh, in higher education, because it's not just DU. Um, and that having some accountability for leadership to help faculty who have not had anyone to decode what these things mean for them, some leadership to direct folks about doing that. So like, don't ask a faculty of color to be the only one to do work on diversity and inclusion, because actually white people are more than capable of doing that 
if they educate themselves, right? Um, it's, it's not like um, we all got the same gene about how to do the work. And it's not just because of our personal experiences. Um, it's about teaching and learning for yourself. So that's sort of one of my one of my things. The other thing is when faculty go up for promotion and tenure, they have to use outside reviewers, right? Outside the university itself. And often for faculty of color who do work, and if they do work that criticizes their colleagues in the same areas who are white, they're criticizing the whiteness of their work, say, and the promotion committees pick outside reviewers who are, who are all white, that's a problem. Like it's, we're not guaranteed that they will understand our work. So having a really deep understanding of what that means to have to do extra work to find the right reviewers who can actually evaluate the real quality of our work, not based on their own personal bias, right? I don't want a scholar who thinks Latinos are a dot on a, a, a chart or a graph to be reviewing my work that's talking about our humanity and the way that we experience structural oppression. So I think that's kind of part of it. Um, and I would say, you know, our university in particular has a long way to um, learn how to live into their spoken values, right? And we have lots of examples about that. You can, I mean, you can start at Pioneer and you can, you know, go to the fact that, you know, the provost is our first female provost. It's like, what year is it? I'm the first Latina full professor. I haven't, I mean, I don't know, it's been five, I don't know, six years or something. What year is it? Those kinds of things. We have to really watch our behaviors because they tell us the truth about what we're actually paying attention to. Um, and again, right, like follow the money, right? It's, um, and we have to not be afraid to make people of wealth unhappy in a moment or give in to threats about what they're gonna contribute to the university because we don't know if that's a reality or not. Yeah, I have taken so much away from this conversation and I know everyone else has. So I wanna just say a sincere thank you um, to all those who have joined us and to our panelists for sharing this space with us. Please join us next week at 11 a.m. for our community leadership webinar featuring Vice Chancellor of Marcoms, Renee Morris and Senior Vice Chancellor of Advancement, Val Otten. Please note we will not be hosting a webinar on March 25th because of spring break. Um, please follow us on social media, which will be linked in our chat. Again, I want to thank everyone for joining us and I hope, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you.